Thank you. Okay, then let's speak on more. Okay. Mm. Hello. Yeah. Okay, mic set up. Okay, yeah, uh, hello. They say good morning. That's not loud enough. Maybe you need some coffee. <laughs> yeah. Okay, once again. Morning. 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 Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thank you, Mumu Code, for inviting me. Yeah. So, anyway, if you're not a Twitter yet, or if you're not a Twitter yet, please set up a Twitter account. And this is my Twitter account. Okay. Got it? Yes. Okay. So. Oh. A little bit about me, I am currently working as a data engineer at uh, ST Engineering. So we have this center called the Data Analytics Strategic Technology Center, whereby we have a team of three data engineers and then quite a number of data scientists. So my background, I come from a background in aerospace engineering as well as computational modeling. And I have some experience working on aerospace related projects, like for example, 3D printing and in raw source and NTU Corp Lab. I've also, done, I've also done like quite a number of computational fluid dynamic, dynamic stuff, which is where I'm ex exposed to parallel processing. And last but not least, if you're in Singapore in town, you could look for me for the best food recommendations. <laughs> yeah, and if you are interested in Industry 4.0, we can have a chat. So, today I will be talking about number one, what is parallel processing? And number two, like, when should you go for parallelism? And last but not least, which is why you're here today, I will be talking about parallel processing and JIT in data science. But before that, I will delve a little bit about some bottlenecks in data science. So, a typical, okay, so a typical data science workflow look like this. First, we need to have the data, right? Because if we don't have data, you can't do much work. After we have the data, we will need to assess the quality, and then like, assess the quality, so usually it will be pretty dirty. So that's where you have data passing, pre-processing, as well as some exploratory data analysis to get some insights on the data. After which, you want to train your model, right? Because, that, because you want to be able to create your predictive modeling so that's where we do the feature engineering, model training, evaluation, visualization reporting. And once everyone's happy, that's where we go into model deployment. So, I raise our hands. Okay, what do you think are some of the bottlenecks in the data science project? Anyone? Quality of the data. Okay, so you said quality of the data. Anyone else? Okay. So you're talking about the speed of querying, uh, querying the data? And then another one. So, um, so you're talking about data curation, right? So the data preparation and stuff. So all of you are right because here are the three biggest complaints about the data science project. <laughs> Number one, it's about the poor quality of data. So sometimes your data is all over the place. Sometimes you have a lot of spelling mistakes, missing data and all. So which is why you have to do a lot of data processing. And when they say that it's actually 80%, it's 80 they say 80% processing, 20% analysis. But in reality, it's actually 90% processing, 10% analysis. So, it's pretty bad. And last but not least, sometimes it's about your organization, which is causing you problems with your data science project. So, so fortunately, ST Engineering is pretty okay in terms of the data, and like, uh, but pretty forward looking. So, I'm in good hands. So, a little bit about the data pre processing, because that's the focus for today. So, Anyone use Python in the room? Okay, it looks like that's quite a lot. So do you know what's Pandas? Oh, yeah, so Pandas is where, where we, load our, we load our data and view our data. That's for the passing part. But, so the, Pandas is a wonderful library. 
but it has a little bit of a problem. If you are loading a large amount of data, it's going to face some performance issues and some runtime issues. So that's a little bit of a limitation of pandas. And if you are, if you are used to Python, you know about the problem of slow loops in Python. So because, uh, because uh, my first programming language is C, when I first learned Python, well, the one thing that pissed me off about Python is about how slow the for loops are. So, so I went to look out on why is that the case, because in Python, the loops are actually run on the interpreter, but for C, it's actually run on the compiler. So there will be a little bit of speed difference, which I will be talking about later on. And because I'm in, a, I'm in a data science team, which is pretty new, and we don't really have a lot of data, so not every data science team has enough data to justify having a Spark cluster. So, so in a way, you can't rely on Spark to process your data. So the question is, what is parallel processing? I'm not going to bore you with the definitions at all, so... Let's imagine I own a bakery cafe. So, a bakery cafe means that you need to have some bread, right? And then, which means I need to make some toast. So, today, I will need to toast 100 slices of bread. So, I have to make some assumptions. Number one, I'm using single slice toasters. So, yeah, I know a lot of people use like double slice toasters, but they actually exist. Number two, each slice of bread takes two minutes to toast. And last but not least, I'm going to assume no overhead time. Okay, so what we are used to is sequential processing. We have 100 slices of bread. We feed them through the toaster. And then we get the toast. Easy enough, right? But... If you look at the execution time, it's going to take 200 minutes for you to process 100 toasts. Now, what about parallel processing? So in parallel processing, same thing. We have 100 slices of bread. We split them into four batches. We feed them through four toasts. So in this case, four toasters. So in this case, the toaster is your processor. And then, the, the task is executed using those processors individually. And, and, well, if one toaster is damaged, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get the rest of the toasters running. So they are actually running parallel and independently from each other. And finally, you've got to consolidate all your toasts into a pool. So the output will have to be consolidated, returned as an output of 100 toasts which may or may not be ordered, but it doesn't really matter in this case. Now, what is of interest will be the execution time. So in this case, with four toasters, I'm going to accomplish that in 50 minutes. So that will be a speed up of about four times. So four cores, four toasters, four times speed up. Now when we talk about parallel tracks, right, there's this concept of Synchronous versus asynchronous execution. But since there's always the question of what do you mean by asynchronous? So because uh, because in Singapore we have the copy.js folks and then we, so we go there, so we hang out, drink coffee, network. So let's do get some ideas from them. Since as JavaScript people, they do more they do async programming more than I do. So yesterday, I posed this question. How would you explain async await and promises to a layman who is new to async programming using coffee, just using coffee? And surprisingly, I had got a few answers from the, from the JS folks. So, okay, this one is a bit of a Singaporean context. So you imagine like we go to a coffee shop, and then we say, uncle, why copy please? Ah? Then uncle will say, okay, uh, I give you this number. So then you will go and sit down, wait until it's ready. Ah, okay? 
Okay, so sit down, surf Twitter. And then after you surf your Twitter happily, and then our uncle will walk over and say, eh, Uncle, ah, ah, that uncle come already. Uh, here's your coffee, here we go. So this is what they call promise. And then a sick await will be, eh, Uncle, ah, give me coffee. Uncle say, okay. Then you just sit, stand there, wait for your coffee, like, Stand there, wait for coffee. So imagine you're at a cone and you have to wait for your coffee. Then just stand there and surf Twitter. And then when you're done, uncle says, Okay, your coffee is ready. You can collect it now. Well, another idea would be, you wake up and then you want to order coffee. Because morning very sleepy, right? So do you wait to then sit down there for your coffee to arrive? Or will you go, you go to and do something else while waiting for your coffee? So I'm not going to go into async away uh, promises like the details, but that is how asynchronous programming kind of works according to the JavaScript people. So here's my interpretation of as here's my interpretation of synchronous versus asynchronous. So task two, a bakery of cafe must have coffee, right? So assumption is that I can do other stuff while making coffee. It's, I can, I can, it's a choice. Number two, one coffee maker, one cup of coffee, and number three, each cup of coffee would take five minutes to finish. So if we're talking about synchronous execution, it means I will brew a cup of coffee, and then I wait for the coffee to be ready before I make the toast. So after seven minutes, you're going to get one toast and one coffee. Do you think it's efficient? No, right? <laughs> There's a better way to do it. So instead of synchronous execution, let's do a synchronous execution. So while I'm brewing the coffee, I'm going to make some toast. So I'm not going to wait for the coffee to finish. So if we are going to do it this way, we are go the workflow is going to look like this. So while I'm still waiting for the coffee to finish, I'm going to make one toast at a time. And then after five minutes, I'm going to get two toasts and a coffee. You think that's much, much better? Yes. So parallelism is very good, right? Sounds pretty good. But when is it a good idea to go for parallelism? Or I should twist it another way. Is it a good idea to simply buy a 256 core processor and parallelize all your codes? Because parallelism is so awesome. Turns <laughs> out, so, not really. Because there are some practical considerations to consider. Number one, is your code already optimized? Because sometimes all you need to do is to rethink your approach and you will ease the bottleneck. So, for example, if I'm using Python, right? And then you say, and you, you, and you use your for loops and you complain that, oh, my for loops are really slow. Maybe you might need to consider using this comprehension instead for your array iterations. Another consideration is about your problem architecture. How does your problem look like? Because the nature of the problem will limit how successful your parallelization can be. So, you may, so I come from a computational fluid dynamics background, and we, are, and we have something like a problem whereby we have to parallelize. But you can't just anyhow parallelize because, like, each part component will depend on the other in a way. So it would be a bit tricky if your problem will consist of processes which kind of depend on each other very closely. Then maybe, maybe you might not want to do parallel processing. And last but not least is, is the one problem that actually impedes parallelism, which is the overhead. Because there's this, there's this law called Amdahl's law, which says that there will always be code that you can never parallelize. I repeat, there will always be code that you can never parallelize. Which 
Yes, so I will go into that later. But another thing to consider is that if I want to parallelize my code, I will also need to consider the extra time to refactor my code, restructure my code, rethink of how I'm going to approach the problem before I can parallelize my code. So, this is MDAO's law. You don't really need to know the details of the equation, but you need to know about this in terms of what's the implication. So MDAO's law, it states that the theoretical speed up, which is the best case scenario for speed up, is defined by a fraction of code that can be parallelized. So if you look at the equation, you have 1 minus p, and then you, and then you have p over n. So you can see that not only does it depend on the number of cores you have, it also depends on how much can your code be parallelized. And unfortunately, there's no clear-cut way to determine that. And if we look at the plots, if there are no parallel parts at all, your speed up is going to be zero, absolute zero. If all parts are parallel, which usually doesn't happen, your speed up will go to infinity, which is not possible actually. So what we can see from the plot is that the speed up is limited by the fraction of the work that can be parallelized. And as much as you want 20, 256 core processor, it will not increase even with infinite number of processors. So you can drop your idea about buying a 256 core processor. Now, when we talk about parallel processing, we also need to talk about what's the difference between multi-processing and multi-threading because those are two different things. So multi-processing means that, I will allow, that, that the system will allow multiple processes to run at the same time using multiple processors. So multiple processors to run multiple processors. For multi-threading, it's quite similar, but it's about executing multiple threads of sub-processors at the same time within a single processor. So single processor, two threads, you run those two threads. And because of the nature of the parallelism, multi-processing will be more suited for large, op large volumes of data, while multi-threading is best suited for I.O. intensive operations. I will, talk about, I will delve a little bit into why you should use multi-processing in this case later on. No. no. So about parallel processing in data science, whereby we have a lot of data. So some context, Python is the most widely used programming language in data science. So, you, so if you want to be in data science, you've got to learn Python. And in Python, we do have an option for distributed processing in the form of PySpark. So we have Spark, which is actually run in Java, but, but then somebody built somebody managed to allow it to be run on Python. However, data processing tends to be pretty compute intensive, which means if I go to run multi-thread, right, I will have to switch from one thread to the other and another thread and go and switch around. And, I keep, and if I keep switching around and I keep have like more and more data, it is going to become increasingly inefficient. And because you are using Python, there is this lock called the global interpreter lock, which does not allow parallel thread execution. So if you're thinking of using multi-threading for data science, forget about it. So if it's so difficult to do parallel processing in Python, how do we do it? So that, okay. Now, if, now, now I know that there are some people who know the module called multiprocessing, but let's talk about another library. It's called, called current.futures, which is a high-level API for asynchronous parallel tasks. So, if you, so in, you have multiprocessing, which allows you to do synchronous, asynchronous, multi-threading, multiprocessing, and then on top of that, you have another layer of extraction for you to do the asynchronous processing. 
So similar to your multi-processing module, you have two modes of execution, multi-processing and multi-threading. And as I was doing my research for the talk, I went to look through the documentation. For process pool executor, it will, the method will actually chop your task into separate tasks. And then, it, and then it will set the chunk size to a positive integer. And then if I have like really, really very large intervals and then I chop them up, it will actually be very efficient if I chop into as many chunk size as possible. For multi-threading, multi there's no such option. Okay, so how do I actually do the operation? So if you know about this function called map, map is, it will take the function that you would like to run, as well as the, it, a list or a table where each element is going to be fed, fed into the function. So recall, recall the analogy of 100 toast fed into the same process called toasting the toast, toasting the bread, and then you will get the, out, the function, you get like the output of the function. And what it returns is an iterator that yields, not returns, the results of the function being applied to every element on the list. Then, so how we actually do the multiprocessing in Kokara Futures, we also use map. So it's a similar concept, except that you need to define your executor, whether is it multiprocessing or multithreading. Okay, so it looks good, right? Now I have a whole bunch of processors and then I parallelize my code and all. But my processing code in Python is still very, very slow. And then when I wake up and I see, wait, wait, it's still processing. What else can I do? Any suggestion? Okay, maybe, maybe not. I'll talk about it. So previously I mentioned that there's the problem of slow loops in Python compared with C. So C is a compiled language. So this is hard. So when I have a C code, I will run it through a compiler to compile the code into this target language. So it could be like an output. And then I have to load that file into a loader, which will translate that target language into machine code such that the machine can understand. And then finally, with that machine code, I load it to the loader, and then I will, it will run the code. As for interpreted languages like Ruby, Python, etc., we have the written code, which kind of goes through a compiler. And then it translates to low, like byte code, which is slightly lower level. And after which, that byte code is dumped into the virtual machine and then you run it. So the difference is that, so you can see that the difference is that you don't really convert into machine code, which is why you take a bit more time to try and interpret the code. And there's an intermediate solution to that, which is using JIT compilation. So JIT compilation, it will convert your source code into native machine code so that you can, at, at runtime, so that you can effectively run as fast as C. And that is actually the reason why, even though Java runs on JVM, it's, it does get comparable performance to C. And in, so in data science, if we, we, we are not really trained in parallel processing, so we are not trained in all your uh, MPI and stuff, so we need a simpler way to do our, our JIT, which comes to the number module. So the number module is a just-in-time compiler for Python that converts Python functions into machine code, and then you run the code in the LLVM compiler. So it can be used very simply by adding a decorator around the function to instruct number to compile that function. So if you know about other, other GIT compiler like mm, Cyton, you need to de define your type, def you need your type definitions, you need to define all your types, you need to 
sort of twist, like go into your code and change it. But for number, you don't need to. And they have two modes of execution. One will be the NJIT for no Python. You go straight to the JIT compiler and you run a code. The second mode is the JIT, whereby you have some codes that you cannot run, you cannot compile into JIT, so you will run those parts into the comp into the interpreter. So now I shall go to the practical implementation. Okay, case study. So wait, let's. So my team decided that okay, let's go for a data size challenge. So the data size challenge consists of some some like hex data and some image data. But the prop, but but what we had run the problems in is the image data because you have 77.6 gigabytes of image files to process. And the data quality is kind of poor because you have some images in RGB, you have some images in RGBA, and then, and then, not, and then not, not all your images are going to be very nice, like 64 times 64. So you, have, like, you have all sorts of sizes, all sorts of dimensions. So you have to standardize them before you feed them into your machine learning model. Okay, so this is the code that I wrote or originally without parallelism. So import sys, import time, I def and then I do my definitions, and I try to time my process, and then I use a while loop. I use a while loop. I use this comprehension. So I did try to optimize my code. But unfortunately, the execution speed is slow like a snail. You know, imagine I, I, I run the script, and then I sleep, and then I wake up after seven hours, it only processed 3,300 images. How am I going to finish my challenge? But, so I went back, looked at my code again, and then I did a bit of research, like try to, try to refactor my code and such that I can run in parallel, and I can run on JIT mode. So, the difference is that I imported number, I used JIT, but I tried using NJIT. But unfortunately, because I'm using the PIL, and the PIL is not supported in number, so I will have to use the JIT. Then, there is this function which does the array partition calculation because I need to split my, I need to sort of manually split my image files into batches. And you can see that I'm also using the JIT. And then we have all the definitions and stuff, and then mm, this is the partition part, and this is where I do the parallel processing. So how do you, how do you use concurrent.futures is that you use you define the executor, and then you apply a map function. So you map, so you have a function, you have whatever that you want to process, you, 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 so you feed, those, uh, feed whatever you want to process into the function through map, and then you get your output using the process pool executor. So after that, to my surprise, it managed to run, run three, like 35,000 images after 3.6 hours. Um, and some things of interest, I was running this code in Google Colab, GPU, two cores, and the speed up is 19.4 times. Yeah, and for some kind of comparison, for the code without parallelism, I was also running using the using the GPU in Colab, so it's a co it, so you, so the comparison is quite fair. And last but not least, the difference is that because we are using a map function and your output is an iterator, you have to store the you have to store the results from the iterator into an array. Okay, so. I've talked a lot, so let's make, so here are some key, key takeaways. Number one, not all processes should be parallelized. 
because of Amdahl's law. That's one. And sometimes it's also about the extra time and effort that you need to parallelize your code. So a little bit of a guideline is that if the cost of trying to rewrite your code such that you can parallelize it, it actually is not as much as the time savings that, okay, if it's not as much as the time savings, right, then go ahead. But if you have to spend like hours and hours trying to make your parallelism code work and the time saving you get is not that much, maybe you should consider other ways of optimizing your code instead. And, another po and the second point is that for JIT, it converts source code from compiler into native machine code. And unfortunately, as I've demonstrated, it may not work for all codes. So, so well, that's always the JIT option. But nevertheless, JIT as compilation, as it will significantly enhance the speed ups provided by body processing. So we have number, we have concurrent of futures, so with, parallel, so with parallel processing, as well as JIT compilation, we are going to get a very significant speed up in our data processing code. So with that, I can have more time to sleep and more time for coffee. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chinhui. Um, I'm sure I'm not sure whether we are actually processing 20 times faster your presentations or not, but any questions for Chinhui? Okay. It's a wonderful presentation. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned yeah. something has said Python is not thread saving. That's no. Do you suggest any other languages other than Python, like GoLang, which is more thread saving to use for data processing data science? Mm. Chinhui, okay. So it's a question about trying to run the data processing code in some in the language in a good language like Golang instead of Python. So, so, so is your question related to like running a compiled language versus an interpreted language? Yeah, it's kind of understanding what other languages other than Python would also help us in this. No. Okay. In anything you have put your thoughts on earlier. Hmm. So okay. So. The languages that I've used, so like I mainly use, would be C, which is compiled, and Python, which is for data science. From my from my understanding, interpreted language like other interpreted languages include Ruby, like Ruby, and then for compiled and then for compiled languages you have GoLang and stuff, and then there's also the in betweens like Java, so. You can't really say that there's a very clear cut difference between compile and interpreter language. So it's a bit, you know, well, if I were to talk about it, it would be a totally new, new uh, another talk. So, mm, so those concepts that I illustrated, they can apply for like languages in like their respective categories. So if you want to see like how do you speed up, you pop, you will need to know have a little bit of understanding of for your language. How does your code run? Any other question? How did Python become the language of data science? Why was it The question is, how did Python become the language of data science? So, how did Python become the language of data science? For that, I will have to show you my code. So, if you take a look at my code, right, it says, with something as the executor, let's map, let's map like, let's say a bunch of toast through a toaster function and then get some output. So why is, Py why is Python now the, like, the, the most popular language for data science? It's because when you look at a code, it's clean, it's easy to understand. You don't need all those curly brackets or even though I'm a curly bracket user myself. And, and and let's say for data scientists, they, they want, their priority is that they want to train a model, they want, to get their work, they want to get their work done, and if you want to worry a little bit too much about all your curly brackets and stuff, that's not what they really like. So that is, so 
that's from my perspective. Uh, in my my data in my team, like my data the data scientists they insist on using Python. Like when we ask, like, do you use R? And they say they still prefer Python because of how easy it is to understand the code. Yeah, and yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you, Shinpi. Uh, any other questions, guys? No? Okay, then let's give a huge round of applause for Shinpi. I'm trying to speed up my walking speed.